I'm happy to unofficially announce that I have won the Ugly Sweater Contest for the second year in a row. I mean, really. Nobody has been able to find a sweater uglier than this one. But I challenge you for next year, see if you can find one. Yep, see if you can find one. I think the Marx family comes really close. They come really close, but nah, I don't think they can compare. <laughs> so, there was this guy, and his name was Charlie Stink. And people... <laughs> People always made fun of Charlie. They always constantly picked on him because of his name, Charlie Stink. And so his friends encouraged Charlie to have his name changed. And finally, he agreed, and he went to court and take all the legal you know, requirements to have his name formally changed. And the next day, his friends asked him, well, what did you have your name changed to? And Charlie Stink replied, I changed my name to George Stink. But I can't see what difference it makes. I think Charlie Stink missed the point of having his name changed. People often miss the point when it comes to Advent and Christmas, don't you think? I mean, for some, this season of the year is, is simply an opportunity to throw parties and, and exchange gifts, and they see it simply as an opportunity to sort of eat, eat, drink, and be merry. And for merchants, it's a time to salvage kind of a bad, you know, year of retail sales. For customers and consumers, it's a period of dread as they contemplate the, the busy, busy, crowded stores and the crowded calendars. And all of this misses the point of Advent and Christmas, of course. Advent and Christmas are about the coming of light and love into our world. Little Joey asked his mother at Christmas time, Mom, why do people put lights on their houses? They're celebrating Jesus' birthday, she replied. When is Jesus' birthday, asked Joey. Well, he was born on Christmas, his mother replied. Jesus was born on Christmas, exclaimed Jeremy. What, wow, what a coincidence. Little Joey is the reason we have all those signs that say Jesus is the reason for the season, right? And of course, it's true. He is the reason for the season. He brought light and love into our world. Now, because of his coming, we have a relationship also with the Father. We have that relationship established because of Jesus. Because of his coming, we ha we, we, it, 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 to help us get to the point, the real point of the Advent season, I have to take us back about 750 years before Christ to a prophet, to a prophet named Isaiah. Now, Isaiah was both a prophet of judgment and a prophet of hope. Over the next four weeks during Advent, we're going to be reading some of Isaiah's most memorable writings concerning the coming of the Messiah. What will it mean for the world when the Messiah comes? That's what Isaiah talks about. But we will also remind ourselves that the manger of Bethlehem was only the beginning of this messianic history. The, the kingdom of God came into the world with the birth of Jesus, but the fulfillment of that kingdom will only come when the love of Christ reigns over all the earth. So Advent is a twofold celebration. It's a celebration of the birth of the Prince of Peace and a celebration of the coming age when peace and joy and the love of Christ will dwell in every heart. But today, our emphasis is on the light of Christmas. Okay, the light. In today's lesson, Isaiah writes, He will judge between the nations. He will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not take up sword against nation, learn, neither will they train for war anymore. Come, O house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Isaiah spoke of a world of peace and light. And today we want to talk about light. Nearly 800 years after the time of Isaiah, the Apostle Paul would write these words, The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than, than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. If there is one theme that is appropriate for this season of Advent, it is light. Some of you have already gotten into the light spirit, right? Got your lights out for your Christmas tree, right? And, and some of you will perhaps decorate your, light, your house with lights inside and outside. Some people just go hog wild with those lights, don't they? And they kind of strain every utility plant for miles around uh, trying to get their, get their fix on lights filled. Well, that's all right. That's a good thing. I like lights. I like Christmas lights. As long as we understand what Isaiah meant when he said, 
Let us walk in the light of the Lord. That's what it's all about. And what Paul meant when he wrote, the night is nearly over, the day is almost here. Let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Well, come back with me to the night of May 5th, 1942. Europe is mired in the brutal violence of World War II. The Nazis are slaughtering millions of Jews throughout Europe. On the night of May 5th, 1942, the Sturmer family decided to hide out from the Nazis in an underground cave. 38 people, ranging in age from a toddler to a, a 75-year-old woman, created an underground home. They had no, no advanced equipment, only some lanterns, cooking pots, firewood, and food. For almost two years, none of these cave dwellers saw the light of day. Some of the men would emerge from the cave at night to search for food and some firewood, but no one came out during the daylight hours. Finally, on April 12, 1943, after receiving news that the Nazis had retreated, the cave dwellers emerged from the underground to see the sun for the first time in two years. How eagerly those cave dwellers awaited being able to, to leave the darkness and walk once again in the light. When Isaiah writes in chapter 9, verse 2, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. He is describing that kind of anticipation about seeing the light which the Messiah will bring. Now, if you want to really appreciate the contrast between darkness and light today, all you have to do is look at a nighttime satellite image of North and South Korea. I got that on the screen for you. As you see, South Korea is bathed in light with its cities gleaming in the blackness, while North Korea, still primitive in so many ways, is dark. Look at the difference. Look at the difference. But it's more than just the lack of of a visible light that makes North Korea a place of darkness. The North Korean government is one of the most repressive governments on earth. Radio and television sets are hardwired to receive only government propaganda. In the year 2004, the government banned cell phones. North Koreans still have no access to the internet, a source of information readily available to almost every other country in the world. There is a significant difference however, between the two. North Korea uh, is, is officially atheist, the remaining Stalinist communist society. The South, on the other hand, has known Christian influence for more than a century. In fact, one of the largest Christian churches in the world is in South Korea. Darkness. Darkness is a very potent symbol of sin and estrangement. Interesting story about, uh, uh, that by author Bruce Larson. He tells of driving on a highway near, near Scranton, uh, Pennsylvania, years ago in the middle of the night. He's driving along, and he was driving along. He took a, a wrapper off some candy. And finding the ashtray already full of candy wrappers, he absentmindedly opened the car window and threw the wrapper out onto the ground. And suddenly, he realized what he had done. He also realized that he never would have done that in the daylight, he wouldn't have done that. Somehow, the very darkness encouraged him to litter, something that he deplores. There is something about light that reminds us of our responsibility to other people and helps us to do the responsible thing. People who do not live in fellowship with others, writes Larson, live in perpetual darkness and continually do things of which they are ashamed. But people who live in a fellowship where they, are, where they know and are known, live in the light, and are encouraged to be and do those things of which they can be proud. But just as darkness is a symbol of sin and estrangement, light represents grace and love. In 1973, Margaret Craven wrote a book titled, I Heard the Owl Call My Name. It is a book where the central character, Mark Bryan, is a young priest who has only three years to live. 
His doctor and his bishop have not told him about his prognosis. The bishop sends Mark to a remote Native American village called Kingcom. He believes that in this small community, Mark will be able to find enough of the meaning of life so that when the time comes, he'll be ready to die. In his first Christmas Eve in the village, Mark is in the church. Everything's ready. He is alone, waiting in the hushed silence with the candlelight shining on the statue that stands in front of the church. It's a statue of Christ holding a lamb. The young priest walks slowly down the center aisle, not wanting to open the door uh, until the very last minute for fear of losing the precious heat in the room. He walks to the window at the left of the door and looks outside. The snow lies thick on the ground. He sees the lights of the houses go out one by one, and the lanterns begin to flicker as the members of the local tribe come slowly, single file, along the path to the church. How many times had the people of his parish traveled this path, he wonders. He goes to the door and opens it, and then steps out into the soft white snow, the snow whispering now under the footfalls. For the first time, he feels he knows the people making their way to his church, and he feels a deep sense of commitment to them. When the first of the tribe reaches the steps, he holds out his hand to greet each of them by name. In this story, Margaret Craven captures the meaning of this season of the year. The darkness of winter and the faithful villagers lighting their lanterns and walking to the little church where light will flood every heart and they will be united in the love of the Bethlehem child. This is a picture of Advent. Darkness is a potent symbol of sin and estrangement. Light is an even more important symbol of grace and love. Walking in, in the light means walking in fellowship with God and with one another. That's what we need to see. Walking in the light is a summons to community, to be in community and, and, and peace. We live in a, a contentious and conflict-filled world. Sometimes even some of our most treasured traditions are a source of conflict. I was amused to read that in, the Fort Collins, in, in Fort Collins, Colorado, some time back, a civic task force recommended that red and green lights be banned from the city's holiday display. Now, why was that? Well, it was deemed that red and green lights were too religious, so they should not be a part of a civic celebration. Okay. So later, some cooler heads on the city council prevailed and the lights were allowed to remain. Well, I doubt that most of us would, would think of Christmas lights as being too religious, especially when we see them adorning the homes of people who verge on, the, on, on being downright pagans. But it reminds us of how, how potent the symbol of light can be. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not ever extinguished it, writes John in the prologue to his gospel. And it's true. Light is more powerful than dark. Love's more powerful than hate. Faith is more powerful than fear. The month of December, in case you haven't noticed, is the darkest month of the year. And it seems especially dark this year. I don't know why. When we put up our Christmas lights, we're, we're hopefully affirming that the darkness shall never overcome the light. We are affirming those positive values of peace and justice and love and hope most of all, we're affirming the presence of God and the light of God in our world. As people of the light, it is our job. It is our job to make sure the light of Christ shines ever more brightly in this world of darkness. Now, how do we do that? Well, by continually walking in the light ourselves, by living a life of integrity and love. There is a story about a church Christmas pageant, a children's Christmas pageant. The day of the presentation finally arrived, a little girl named Olivia was so excited about her part that her parents thought she had, you know, played one of the main characters, though she had not told them what she was to do. The parents of the children in the pageant were all there, and, and uh, one by one the children took their places. Uh, Olivia's parents could see the, the shepherds, they were fidgeting out there in one corner of the stage, which was evidently intended to be a field. Mary and Joseph, they stood solemnly behind the manger. 
In the back, three young wise men waited impatiently, but still little Olivia sat quietly and confidently. Then the teacher began, a long time ago, Mary and Joseph had a baby, and they named him Jesus. She said, and when Jesus was born, a bright star appeared over the stable. At that cue, Olivia got up from her chair, picked up a large gold star, walked behind Mary and Joseph, and held the star high in the air for everybody to see. When the teacher told about the shepherds coming to see the baby, the three young shepherds came forward, and Olivia jiggled the star up and down to make sure they knew exactly where they were supposed to go. When the wise men came and, and responded to their cue, she went forward a little to, to greet them and lead the way. Her face was shining almost as bright as probably that original star was. Well, the play ended. They had their obligatory refreshments. And on the way home, Olivia said with great satisfaction, I had the main part. You did? Her mother asked, wondering why she thought that. Yes, she said, because I showed everybody how to find Jesus. Ultimately, that's what it means to walk in the light. It is to show the world how to find Jesus. It is to live so that people see in us year-round the love of the child of Bethlehem. That is our part that is our thing, and it's the main thing, and it's the main part, to show the world the light of Jesus Christ. Amen.